Uh, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is uh, Thursday, and we're talking with Tom Yamachika about tax, talking tax with Tom. Tom is president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, and we are in a strange legislative session, uh, namely a session where it looks like we're going to have $1.4 billion deficit where everybody's scrambling to uh, raise the money to cover the deficit because the Constitution doesn't allow a deficit at all. So this is very troubling. And there are two ways that you can resolve that. One is you can cut expenses, and the other way is you can raise taxes. And we're going to talk about that today. Welcome, welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks for having me on the show, Jay. So, um, okay, we still have this huge looming prospect of a deficit. Uh, I thought it was interesting that the governor is having a party at Washington Place for sixty-three thousand um, dollars. I guess, I guess that is an exception to the whole problem that parties come first. Um, but beyond that, we're having, we're having problems in raising the money. And I suppose we're having problems politically in cutting the expenses. So let's talk about raising the money first. Um, I think the governor came up with a very modest tax increase bill on, on, on some kind of um, you know, lesser tax. And then other bills were introduced by other legislators for a sweeping array of tax increases. What's happening there? Yeah, I mean, at the at the moment, um, I've I've been through like two thirds of the bills, and I've already flagged three hundred of them for us to follow. Um, that's quite a bit more than most years, so uh, it's going to be rough for us, I think, in terms of of the tax foundation following uh, the bills that are in the legislative hopper. Uh, there are a lot of the usual suspects. Uh, a number of bills come up uh, time and time again. Uh, there are some that are very troubling. We've talked about you know, some of those in prior years. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll talk about some of those here. Uh, for example, we talked about uh, a, uh, a bill that was in prior sessions to uh, impose a massive surcharge on uh, what we call flip transactions. If you buy a house and then sell it within, you know, within a, few, a few months or a year, uh, there's, there's a bill to impose a conveyance tax surcharge of 25% of the net proceeds, uh, which is a huge amount, you know, at least can compare to the treasury. I mean, that, that's 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 not a tax. It's a uh, forfeiture. <laughs> it's a confiscation. Yeah. Um, there there are uh, bills to uh, raise the income tax uh, massively, uh, whereby if you are in the highest bracket, uh, you will not be taxed at eleven percent anymore. It will be sixteen percent, and uh, oh, but but we don't have, you don't have to worry because it's only for six years. Okay. Yeah. How, how, yeah. And then when six years comes around, then guess what happens? It make, it gets uh, a life of its own again. Yeah. Taxes never go down, do they? Uh, it's very rare. Yeah. Uh, a, a lot of times you see uh, measures that start as temporary taxes. Um, and they, like I said, take on a life of their own. My favorite example is the transient accommodations tax. It was supposed to fund the convention center. It was, uh, you know, 5% uh, when it was enacted in 1986. Uh, it's still around. It's now 10 and a quarter percent. And, uh, uh, and the convention center has been built and was finished a long time ago. Yeah, I look at how the barrel tax has been kicked around over the past few years. It's really a long way from its original intention. Oh, the barrel tax is another one. Um, there are proposals in this session, uh, and let me just kind of backtrack a little bit. Uh, the, uh, the barrel tax is imposed on fossil fuel, uh, whether you, uh, you know, when, it, when it's imported. Uh, and it doesn't have to be gas, doesn't have to be petroleum, 
uh, just has to be fossil fuel. So it could be uh, it could be propane, it could be coal, um, it, it could be uh, anything that uh, you know comes out of the ground. Um, it started off as uh, five cents a barrel, and then a few years later, it was raised two thousand percent to a dollar and five. The current proposals would replace it with a uh, what's called a carbon tax, uh, which which basically is the same thing, except it's it's now expressed in uh, in terms of um, dollars per metric ton of carbon dioxide that is emitted. Okay, uh, and the proposals are you start off at forty, and you go to eighty. And what that translates to is about 50 cents per gallon, which uh, when you're talking about a, a barrel uh, is um, uh, $21 for a barrel instead of a dollar five. So another 2000% increase uh, is what they have in store for that one. How many gallons in a barrel? 42. Okay. 42. So, and and it, and that's not the worst bill. Uh, there's there is a bill uh, that would raise the barrel tax to one dollar a gallon. So forty two dollars a barrel, corresponding to I think uh, one hundred and forty five dollars per uh, per metric ton. So uh, and you know it, it it all comes in gradually. Uh, it, it it sneaks up on you over. You know, over a period of ten years, but uh, when you're at twenty thirty, you get the full hit of it. Yeah. Where does this stuff come from? Did you say three hundred bills to raise taxes. That's that's very discomforting. It's like it's like everybody in the world wants to raise taxes. Who? But who? Who is actually introducing these bills? It comes from various sources. Uh, I mean, each has to be signed off on by a legislator. Uh, some of them come from the administration, some of them come from the counties, um, some of them come from other groups that ask legislators to uh, introduce these bills for them. So they come from everywhere. So and some of them, some of them are like fall in line with um, existing tax framework. Um, and others, it sounds like they do violation to the framework and to the rates. Yeah, uh, and then and some of them are, are really couched in terms of, you know, not, you know, being a tax at all, but 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 being a social, um, a social measure. Like for example, the governor, in his package, uh, has a, a sugar sweetened beverage tax. Uh, it, it was it was spoken of in an article this morning. Uh, it, it would raise uh, they estimate sixty million dollars a year, which is you know not much, uh, but the governor is thinking it's an important tool of social policy, and 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 so that bill is not being introduced by uh, the Department of Tax, but by the Department of Health. It's a healthy thing. We want to uh, impose this tax, and Establish a healthy Ohana special fund into which the proceeds of the tax. I, I just wonder what goes through the mind of the person who introduces a bill like that, whether it be at the Department of Health or otherwise. You know, we, we have um, crises going on. We, we have COVID, which is very threatening, especially now with the variants. We have the economy, which has taken a big hit and is likely to fall much further before it stops falling. And you know, we have we have um, social problems about people who can't eat, and um, we're talking about a tax on sugary drinks. It just seems to me out of proportion. Why, why can't we get together and focus? Can't we focus down there? Why do we have to have three hundred bills on? It doesn't, doesn't, don't they talk to each other? Uh, well, I think they will after all the bills have been introduced and, and the committees start whittling these down. Uh, we're expecting 2,500 bills in, in total to be introduced 
of which maybe 300 will pass. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the, uh, you know, I mean, it's always thus, it's always in the thousands and you really wonder why they get introduced in the first place. I mean, I think the mark of a, a better legislator is a fellow who says, thank you, Mr. Jones, for your suggestion, but I'm not going to introduce that. Um, but they always do. They always introduce everything that crosses their desk and then we get a lot of crap to deal with. Um, it would be better if they said no when it was an inappropriate bill. But anyway, look, looking at- well, Politically, looking at, that's not how it works, Jay. I know, I know, you, it's you, political. You have, to, you have to satisfy your constituent. Yes, I'll introduce the bill and then, and then you know, torpedo it later. There's something deceptive about that. Of course it is. Yeah. But, but uh, we, we won't be the first legislature to do this and we won't be the last. It goes, it goes on everywhere. We got to straighten this government out. I mean, in the country. Anyway, um, if people are too interested in, you know, in, in satisfying their constituents and not in actually having, um, engaging with their constituents. But let's let's go to the tax increase bills. I mean, what, what are the chances that we're going to have um, a whole spate of increases here that will make your heart sing? Well, I think what's going to happen, uh, realistically speaking, is uh, we're going to go through the legislative session for a while and have uh, you know initial hearings on lots of these to kind of uh, weed out the really, really, really bad ones. And then uh, at some point, somebody's gonna sit down at the budget table and say, okay, um, are we going to institute furloughs? Are we going to uh, do cost cutting? And if the answer is no, then we got a PUCA and we got to, and we have to fill the PUCA. Uh, and what do you fill the PUCA with? Well, uh, so bill number one has a price tag of X, bill number two has a price tag of Y. So you keep adding items from the menu until the PUCA is filled. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to happen. So it's interactive then. You, you, in other words, while you're looking at the tax bills, you're looking at cutting costs. Yeah, I mean that's that's I think how it should be. Um, yeah. The 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 uh, you know the question is going to be uh, how much uh, spine the legislators are going to have to to deal with some of this stuff. You remember the constitutional amendment uh, that we were dealing with, uh, you know, just a few years ago on. Uh, giving the state power to over the property tax once again. Well, that's uh, that's here. Uh, there are, are uh, more than one bill uh, to propose a constitutional amendment. Uh, one one just says, oh, let's uh, give the state additional power over the property tax, not really specifying what it's going to be used for. Uh, an another is basically saying, oh, we need to uh, support our educators and and, uh, and uplift our keiki. Uh, so, um, so we needed another revenue source to do that. So let's uh, we'll go bang our speculators uh, through the property tax. You know, uh, it's, it's a, a, a new variation on the old theme. And we've seen this before and the voters shot it down once. Uh, but the question then becomes, are the legislators going to put to the voters again? That's, that hasn't happened just yet, though. That hasn't happened just yet. I mean, there are bills to do that, but it remains to be seen whether they'll advance. Yeah. So when you go down and testify on these bills, you know, what, what's your philosophy about it? Do you, do you try to see it and testify about it as, as a comprehensive you know, saying, um, you know, uh, we, we can't afford this tax unless you drop expenses or um, if you take this tax along with the other taxes, uh, it'll be, you know, over taxation, inequitable and I'll negative. Wait, I mean, do you, do you look at them in silos or do you look at the comprehensive when you go and testify? Well, when, when I testify, I, you know, try to make sure uh, that our policymakers know of, uh, you know, different consequences that may befall uh, you know, the state and its economy if you, if you pass this stuff. Um, you know, I'm not there to balance the budget. I'm not there to, uh, uh, to, to, you know, know what is the best social policy for our state. What I, what I am there to do is say, okay, 
you pass this, here are the consequences. So, so people at least have an idea of what they're voting on as opposed to just blindly following something else. Is it, is it normative where you say, this is really, this is not a good bill. There's the consequences here are so draconian, you should not take this bill one inch further. You ever say that? No, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't take positions on any bill um, be, because of my tax exempt status. Um, again, what I do is I, I say, uh, you know, here are the consequences. Is this really what you want? So it's up to them to figure out what those consequences, whether those consequences are acceptable in the larger right. picture. In, 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 uh, in some cases, I do say, okay, what you got here is unconstitutional and here's why, or it's prohibited by federal law and here's why. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in theory, the attorney general should be telling him the same thing. Okay. Well, um, how about other people who testify? Do they come down and take positions? Of course they do. What, uh, what, what, is, what is the general approach that t they take in a year where there are 300 bills to increase taxes? Um, well, it depends on, on who you are and what your interest is. Um, to, uh, a lot of times the, uh, the government employee unions will come down and say, yeah, we need, we need more revenue. Uh, what they may not say is, you know, to fund our raises. Uh, and, and they say, yeah, go ahead, and ra go ahead and raise taxes. We can, you know, we can do this. Uh, and and what they're really saying down. is, what they're really saying is we, we need the state to have the revenue so they can pay our membership. Oh, yeah. Isn't that and transparent? They, uh, sometimes. <laughs> and then, and then, then, of course, you have some business groups not, not enough, but some business groups come down and say, you know, this is an outrage. This is, uh, you know, our businesses will close down, our investments will dry up, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, and like, you, you know, this is the year after the year in which the legislature was closed, essentially. They're still closed. The well, building's still closed. I mean, they were, last year they were closed to the point where they really weren't doing any legislation. This year, they, they're committed to do legislation, right? even though it'll yes. be virtual. And my question to you is, um, do they understand we're in a crisis? Uh, or is this just business as usual? Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, I haven't really had a chance to, uh, to engage with a lot of them because, you know, like I said, the building's closed. Um, so I, you know, usually by this time, I, I, I would have been down at the Capitol a few days and, you know, speaking to people, uh, you know, whoever I can kind of catch in the hallway. Uh, can't do that anymore. Mm. Well, so what, what's your sense of it? I mean, uh, this good and, good and valid reason to increase the taxes uh, to avoid a, a shortfall. Um, are we going to have a big increase in a sweeping increase in taxes this year? Is that, is that what's in line here for us? Well, you know, with, with a $1.4 billion shortfall, I mean, that's, that's huge. Uh, and, you know, something huge has to be done about it. If you, uh, if you can't do your furloughs, if you can't do your uh, cost cutting, uh, and you got to find a, a big number out of the tax system. That's not easy. So, if if you want to get say half a billion dollars, you have to do it with a GET increase, or you have to do something drastic to the net income tax. Yeah, sugary Personally. drinks. Sugary drinks is not going to do it. Sugary drinks may ra may raise you sixty million dollars, which is very short of of one point four billion. Yeah. Okay, so I, I guess that's got to be clear, and the money committees will be saying that, and the um, uh, I don't know. I guess the governor's office will be saying that, or um, maybe the tax office will be saying that. Um, so you, you have you have a whole push on trying to comply with the constitution, trying to cover that shortfall. 
Yeah, and there, and there are going to be other things happening. Like, for example, um, you know how the transient accommodations tax normally uh, is siphoned off a bit for the counties? Uh, the governor has stopped that by emergency proclamation, and there are some bills to continue that. So, so basically, you know, counties, you're on your own. Yeah, I'm, I'm very troubled by that. You know, when I, when I went to law school, my, one of my early professors said, you know, the, the problem with these bills is they, they don't give you the level of intensity that the legislature, you know, has adopted in passing the bill. Well, what they should have is at the bottom of the bill, there should be a little thing that says, we mean it. And, and then the effective date, um, <clears throat> very bottom. And in cases where the legislature is even more concerned, um, at the bottom of the bill, they would say, we, we really, really, really mean it. Um, and and one, a reason I raise this silly story is that <laughs> um, the, the, the bill for the transient accommodations tax specifically allocated uh, that tax but to the counties. And, and then the governor emergency proclamation said, no, I'm not going to follow that. And then the legislature has to come in and say, no, 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 we mean it. We really, really mean it. We meant what we said when we adopted the bill in the first place. It's like, it's almost like an emergency override, isn't it? Well, that, that I think brings up another you know, separate question, which some of these bills do address. And that is, you know, how much emergency power do you give the government? Uh, the, the current framework is, you, you know, you give the governor emergency powers for 60 days, but the governor found a kind of a way to, uh, to work around it by, by on the 59th day coming in and saying, we still have an emergency, so I'm going to exercise my powers for 60 days more, right? So now you have um, 119 days instead of 60, and then it goes to 100, you know, uh, 178, and then <laughs> well, you know, this, now that takes me to the question of just how much power does the governor have to reduce expenses? You talk about furloughs. Is, is that the stroke of a pen? Um, does that require legislative action? Does it require legislative action to override the stroke of the pen? I mean, you, get, you really get a little confused as to who's in charge here in the time of an emergency, which... Um, repeats itself and, you know, extends beyond anybody what anybody expected. So if he really wanted to knock off um, a substantial part of that 1.5 billion by reducing, by slicing and dicing um, expenses at the state level, including expenses that go to the union members, including those, okay, can he do that with the stroke of a pen, Tom? Uh, that's, that's in dispute. Uh, he tried to do that, uh, and the and the uh, HSTA came and said, "We'll sue your butt because uh, you got a contract. Uh, we have a contract, and you can't just unilaterally alter it like that." Well, what Maybe happened? Can, he backed he off. Yeah, of course he backed off. Ooh, 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 I didn't mean it. <laughs> So maybe maybe your furloughs will start in six months. Uh, maybe they won't. Oh, and and uh, uh, by the way, uh, DOE, uh, you know, we asked for them to to drop their budget by ten percent. We we really meant two and a half. So. <laughs> well, I mean, this is a, this is a problem because you know when you do that, what happens is that the public winds up paying. The public has all these tax increases uh, on the horizon here, and it makes up the shortfall out of squeezing the public. But if he yeah, has the and, power, and, and, it, and it really makes the governor look like a wimp. Yeah. Uh, you know, he, he comes up, makes big body and says, I'm going to do furloughs. I'm going to do cost cutting uh, because the public's had enough. Well, maybe I didn't mean that. <laughs> well, that's, a, you know, another flaw in the system as far as I'm concerned, that he would make what, what might be a very good decision a decision appropriate to the times and the and the true emergency that we're in the middle of, and then somebody can throw them, throw them out of that, uh, which is I guess what's happening. Yep. Could, so it, it, could he 
assuming that that he has the uh, you know the, the force of will to do this sort of thing, could he um, resolve the budget shortfall all by himself? Have you made a, a calculation? Could he raise 1.4 or 1.5 billion um, by the stroke of a pen and thus make it unnecessary for us to have tax increases? Uh, theoretically, yes. Um, and you would you would start by, you know, having the governor submit a balanced budget to the legislature. But you know, in past years, he hasn't done that. He he submitted a budget to the legislature with with severe gaps, and and he's and he's kind of uh, you know left it to the legislators to uh, you know to make the painful cuts, uh, which they don't appreciate, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Too bad. Too bad. It's not. It's not working well, and we'll we'll pay a price because we because the public cannot afford to pay tax increases. That's that's another question. I don't know if the tax foundation makes an analysis, but if I if I raise um, you know so the real estate uh, capital you know sales sales capital capital gain tax on real property to sixteen percent confiscatory as it may be. Can people afford that? What effect does that have on the economy? Uh, have you have you organized testimony on that point? It seems like to me, as you say, each one of these increases has consequences. It has an effect beyond just raising the money. It could yeah, be the, the, undermining the, the economy and the, the life and quality of life of the people in the state. Yeah, and ultimately what happens is the people vote with their feet, okay? Um, it's, it's been well documented that Hawaii has been losing population uh, to places like, you know, Nevada, where there is no income tax, no personal income tax. Uh, Florida, same. Um, Texas. Sure. And sure. Uh, if you have a smaller tax base, can you, you know, maintain the same level of spending? No. Well, no, no. Unless, then, you're, then it's a spiral down, isn't it? Yes, it is. And and the fewer people are left, they they have to pick up more of the slack. Yeah. So, um, what what would your advice to the governor be at this point, knowing all of these balls are in the air? What would you suggest to him? What I would what I say, what I would suggest to him is, you know. Uh, show leadership, stick to your guns, do what you think is right for, you know, for the people. And um, uh, follow through with what you what you say you're going to do. You, you stand for something. Uh, you, ha you, you have to, uh, you, you have to walk the walk. That said, Tom, what, what's your advice to the legislature? I mean, for them to be consistent with that, they would say to him in the cloakroom, they would say, we want you to stick to your guns and we are not going to give you um, the tax increases that we would, might otherwise consider. We're going we're gonna to let you swing on this. Or would you say to them, well, why don't you make a determination of um, tax increases that you know should happen were the governor to stick to his guns? What would you suggest? to a sitting legislator on this? Uh, what I would say is, you know, look, um, know your constituents, not just not just the ones who are, you know, beating on your office door and seeing raised taxes. Uh, you know, look at the, you know, the, the, the people who are actually in your district and trying to uh, live and work and, and, and have a life, uh, you know, how, how heavy is the how, is the hand of government going to be on them? Are you going to you know put uh, you know more monkeys on their back uh, just to just to just to get by, uh, or are you going to you know help make the burden lighter and uh, and deal with the consequences of that amongst the uh, you know the special interests that come? Yeah, you got to look further into the future. So, um, you know, it's, it's funny, I take away from this conversation that on the one hand, um, the, 
uh, the reason that the governor is um, uh, less than um, less than strong um, on on reducing expenses is because the unions are coming to him and saying, "No, you can't, you can't reduce the expenses as far as our membership is concerned." And further, that the people who are asking for tax increases, although it may be the administration itself, those people include the very same unions who say, we want you to raise taxes so there's enough money to continue paying our membership. It's really an odd configuration when you put it all together. Um, anyway, last question, Tom, what's gonna happen? Well, um, we don't know right now, but we'll, we'll see how the process plays out. I mean, there's gonna be hearings starting. Uh, we at the Tax Foundation have you know, gone through a number of these bills. We have them on our website, so you can, you know, you can see snippets of, uh, you know, what people have proposed. And then, um, as the uh, days and weeks go by, it, you'll see some of these start to fall off. Uh, bills will die, and then we'll see what remains standing at the end. Yeah, and you can come here to Think Tech and check us out on talking tax with Tom every other Thursday, and we can give you a snapshot of how uh, those bills are doing, right, Tom? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate you coming down. And I am no less frightened than I was when we started. Perhaps I'm <laughs> more frightened. Thank you for being here. Aloha, Thank you. Tom. <laughs>